Hello from San Francisco. You are tuning in to a Sundance Film Festival Beyond Film panel brought to you by the Roxy Theater. My name is Lex Sloan, and I'm proud to be the executive director here. And although we've been closed for almost a year, we remain committed to sharing great works of art and conversation in the virtual space. At the Roxy, we believe movies don't end with the credits, and we so terribly miss hanging out in the lobby, smelling like popcorn, and talking movies with y'all. One of our favorite neighbors in the mission is the Bay Area Video Coalition, who we are enthused to partner with again for today's conversation, It's Not Lost in the Archive, about the preservation of and access to cultural memory in the audiovisual archives. This is a fundraiser for BayVac, so thanks to all who donated when they registered, and if you're moved to donate, you can do so uh, in the link in the chat. A heartfelt thank you to Morgan, Preservation Director at BayVac, who will be moderating today's conversation. Also, thank you to Stephen, Executive Director of CAM, Pamela, Director of California Revealed, and Pedro, filmmaker of Rebel Hearts, for joining us here today. I know we're all in for a real treat. So, Morgan, take it away. Hi, my name is Morgan, and I'm BayVac's Preservation Director. I'm going to be moderating this panel, and I'm going to take some time to discuss the work that BayVac does to preserve obsolete audiovisual media. First, let me tell you a little bit about BayVac. BayVac is now in our 45th year of operation as a nonprofit media art center serving San Francisco. BayVac has gone through many changes in these 45 years, but our mission has always been to create and foster equity in storytelling. We currently host media technology classes, youth programming, apprenticeships, media fellowships, community programming, and house a state-of-the-art digitization lab for media preservation. What is preservation? Preservation is the art of making things last. In the case of old analog video materials, the best way to make them last is to digitize them. The tapes themselves are deteriorating, and the decks are rapidly becoming difficult to find, fix, and maintain. As you can see here, we have a large collection of vintage video equipment that we can use in order to get the best possible image off the tapes that we preserve. As you might imagine, it can be rather expensive to keep this kind of system running, and in turn, it can often be pretty expensive to digitize and preserve tapes. The expense of digitization is often a big impediment to equity. Magnetic tape was the primary mode of storage for the documentation of moving images in the second half of the 20th century, and as a result, there's a great deal of cultural memory and stories held on this now obsolete media. These stories will disappear once the tapes become unplayable. As is so often the case, stories by and about marginalized communities are the most at risk, since these communities often lack the resources to properly digitize and preserve them. That's where the Preservation Access Program comes in. With generous support from the National Endowment of Humanities and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, BayVac is able to offer steeply discounted transfer services through the Preservation Access Program. How does it work? BayVac puts out a call for applications. These applications are then reviewed by a panel of local archivists, media specialists, artists, and community members. The panelists are all asked to rate the applications based on the artistic and cultural significance of the collection, as well as whether the collection is at risk of being lost if it isn't preserved immediately. By relying on the community to make this selection, we're able to ensure that the materials represent a wide range of cultural demographics. This helps ensure that the program aligns with BayVac's greater mission, which comes down to giving a voice to people from under-resourced and underrepresented communities. The goal of the Preservation Access Program are twofold. First, to provide digitization services to individuals and organizations that would otherwise not be able to afford them. And second, to promote access to digitized materials. Participants in the program are expected to make their collections available and accessible to audiences. That can mean a lot of things, such as putting the videos on YouTube or on their website, or by holding virtual or in-person screening events, or by using the material in a documentary. You may see where I'm going with this. Documentary filmmakers are encouraged to apply to the Preservation Access Program if they need archival footage digitized for their film, especially if their films discuss social justice issues. BayVec is very proud to have worked with a wide range of organizations, institutions, artists, and individuals who at some point have been on the cutting edge of media technology and storytelling. I'm going to take a moment now to highlight a collection of videos that we've preserved through the Preservation Access Program. These clips are from the collection of the People's Video Theater and Survival Arts Media. In the 1970s, the People's Video Theater and Survival Arts Media produced videos using Sony porta pack cameras. These programs chronicled the counterculture and liberation movements that transformed the politics of America. 
The real-time recording and playback capabilities of this new medium allowed the People's Video Theater to capture material and play it back immediately, enabling participants to shape their own stories on screen and to initiate dialogue or mediation with audiences to resolve conflicting viewpoints and affect positive change. Survival Arts Media explored the video medium in diverse areas, including improvisational street theater, political activism, artistic biography, public access television, and immersive multimedia performance. Howard Gustat and Ben Levine, members of both video collectives, have established an archive documenting their early independent video projects. The 10 terabyte archive was digitized at Bayback and has been accessioned as part of NYU's Special Collections Library. One significant project in this archive includes videotapes recorded at Camp Jeanette, a summer camp for young people with disabilities in upstate New York. These direct and empathetic recordings are featured in Crip Camp, a documentary which received the Sundance 2020 Audience Award and the 2021 Independent Documentary Association Award. Preserving content like this is extremely uplifting. It feels good when we're able to save the cultural memories and present them to future generations. However, there are many times where it's extremely difficult to do this work. Every year, the condition of tapes gets worse and worse. Most of the tapes from the 70s are not playable without remediation methods, and so it takes a long time and lots of hands-on work to get them to play nicely. At Bayback, we're lucky to have cleaning decks. These are exceedingly rare, and we have them for many of the formats we support, as well as skilled technicians who are trained in identifying issues with tapes and performing advanced remediation techniques. Tapes are assessed upon arrival, then baked and cleaned and repaired as needed. Playback decks are cleaned and video levels are adjusted before every tape is played to ensure the best possible quality. The decks are becoming harder to find and even harder to fix. We're lucky to have collected this equipment throughout the decades, but it's getting harder and harder to maintain the equipment that is necessary to do this work. Most of the companies that make digitization equipment are starting to move away from supporting our workflows. If the current pace continues, preservation grade digitization equipment will become completely relegated to boutique and thus very expensive products. As a small nonprofit entity, our ability to continue doing this work comes down to being able to drum up funding and advocacy for the Preservation Access Program. So with that, I'd like to invite anyone with archival materials in their collection or films to apply for the Preservation Access Program. If you have any further questions about the program or application, we're holding an online informational event on February 2nd at 5 p.m. Pacific on our Twitch channel. That's twitch.tv slash Preserve. Thanks! Okay, so uh, that's the introduction, and um, yeah, uh, up next is Pamela. No? Yes. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Pamela, Pamela Vatican, I'm Director of California Revealed, and I wanted to thank Morgan so much and Bayback for facilitating this conversation. And um, thank you to Lex and the Roxy for hosting. It feels really good to be at the Sundance Film Festival and make some new friends today. Um, so I work for California Revealed, which is a California State Library digitization and preservation program that provides free online access to archival materials from California's public libraries, archives, museums, historical societies, other cultural heritage groups um, for the purposes of education, research, and enjoyment, of course, which is why we're here. We're funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the Library Services Technology Act. So I wanted to thank IMLS. Um, it's been going for about 10 years now, thanks to their funding. So um, I just wanted to give an overview of our program and our team, and then I was going to show some clips and um, speak some hard truths today about the, the labor of this work. Um, so our services, just a quick overview. Um, most of our funding and our effort goes toward providing free digitization, preservation, and online access services to cultural heritage institutions across the state. Um, we help with the heavy lifting of prepping for digitization, checking the files, um, uploading the files online, and then providing long-term preservation offline um, on data tape for all the master files. And um, we call this a partnership because we try to meet the participants where they are. Um, our process is based on best practices, but we really try to be practical because our most of our partners have limited resources um, as Morgan alluded to in his presentation. Um, there's just um, a lot of work, a lot of maintenance involved, um, but we, believe that doing something's better than doing nothing. 
So um, basically, um, we provide these services, we push out our records to just to CaliforniaReveal.org, but also to Calisphere, DPLA, WorldCat, Home Movie Registry. Um, really just the more access points means broader exposure. Um, so California Reveals our, our main website. We've been there um, for a couple of years now. We just um, launched our new site. Um, and then we're starting to do some digital exhibits as well through Scalar. Um, so yeah, and then our, our, um, our webinars and well, our workshop, we used to do in-person workshops every summer and we're now doing webinars um, really to get the word out about the program, but also we teach um, best practices for um, digital preservation, planning projects, um, just kind of getting people um, up to speed on the process. Um, and then we're also doing, we're starting to do community archiving workshops initially funded by a separate grant, but we're now um, providing um, small mini grants to help support people do those workshops. And I'll talk about that model in a, a little bit later. Um, we're also providing um, mini grants, we call them, um, up to 5,000 to kind of um, push the process along for folks. So um, we help people with cataloging grants, um, supply, rehousing supplies. Um, and then on the flip side, after collections are digitized, we help support outreach projects because we really do feel like digitization is just the first step and there's so much more um, to do once the collections are available. And new this year is um, providing support for memory labs, um, thanks to the State Library. Another grant program they're starting is um, to support memory labs across the state and we're providing some webinar training to support that. So I'm here um, really on behalf of a team of eight um, digital preservation librarians based in Sacramento at the State Library. So I definitely wanted to give them a shout out. Um, this really is not just a process, but you know, there's a lot of labor involved and it's a labor of love. So um, I wanted to thank our preservation managers, our digital repository manager and our digital services librarians. Um, who I hope they might be here in the, the audience, so hello and, and thank you for all their work that they're doing. And we used to be a, a program of two, a team of two, and we've grown um, with the demand for our services. So um, just keep going. And, and we're also having, uh, we also have an advisory committee um, who you know, help us review the nominations every year. And we check in um, twice a year just you know, to um, reflect, review our, our goals, our accomplishments. We're always welcome to new ideas. We want to continue to grow creatively. Oops. And this is just a sample. We serve over 300 institutions across the state. This is kind of like a random alphabetical assortment. Um, but you can see by you know, looking at the map that we are missing quite a lot of the state. Um, large clusters on the coast, um, around the Bay and Los Angeles, and we're really trying to reach um, more folks. A lot of this is really dependent on our workshops. So as we're changing to kind of online training, um, this can change. And we're also hoping um, to fill in the map as we build our community um, archiving workshops and our memory labs to meet more communities. So some hard truths. Um, Wes, we may, we may not be lost, but we definitely can't save everything in the archives. So um, I think there is an assumption that maybe that is our job and our responsibility, but it's truly impossible. Um, we don't have resources to save everything. Um, so preservation really um, demands, requires an explicit commitment of resources because we just don't have enough. There will never be enough. So we really have to make some tough decisions. Um, and it can be subjective. So I, I, with that in mind, I, I did want to show our little clip reel and you can kind of think about um, what we've done so far and how much we have to go, how much further we have to go. So Morgan's gonna roll the screen. Okay. 
California Revealed started off in 2010 as a project focusing on audiovisual recordings to primarily address issues that plague legacy media collections, such as unprocessed backlogs, the obscurity of playback equipment for obsolete formats, and inherently fragile material, such as magnetic audio and video tape. In 2018, at the request of the State Librarian, we expanded our scope to accommodate print collections. So we now have diaries, photographs, postcards, scrapbooks, newspapers, and transcripts, along with oral history recordings, home movies, news film, advertisements, documentaries, public access television, and more, collected by over 300 partner organizations. It's really wonderful to be able to accommodate mixed collections at this point, meet a wider range of preservation needs of our partners, and to supplement and complement the sights and sounds of the audiovisual recordings with the written record of the paper-based collections. We can work with any nonprofit collecting organization based in California, and we set the bar relatively low to participate, recognizing that many of our participants have limited resources and very limited time. Some are loan arrangers or volunteers. We serve a diverse group of keepers, public library history rooms, archives, historical societies, academic libraries, and independent producers. All of us are collective partners in the effort to save California history, which as you can imagine is a never ending effort. Perhaps some of you out there are struggling with your own collections. You're not alone and we'd love to help you too. As a publicly funded project, everything we digitize is publicly available online at CaliforniaRevealed.org. Mostly stream only, but we also have a huge amount of public domain materials that are free to download and reuse at the Internet Archive. This is such a rich research resource of mostly unpublished primary source materials, history as it happened, better than a textbook. There's nothing like hearing and seeing the ghosts of the past come to life unmediated. This is the prologue and making these materials available is only the beginning. We truly want people to dig in and find new narratives, new perspectives, new connections. We'd love to hear what you're finding and not finding, and we welcome your participation. I want to thank Digital Services Librarian Willa Germs, who put together these clips with a focus on people telling their own stories. Thank you so much, Willa. Um, yeah, so I, I did want to give you like a little taste of what we have, um, but there's definitely um, a challenge of, of reaching more folks. Um, we know that what's been collected is already kind of a limited story, um, and we know that we are missing more community stories, um, people telling their own stories, and stories are missing. So um, we're hoping like you know, this is kind of our traditional model is doing these workshops and, and meeting people on the ground, which I think is important. Um, but I do look forward to working more directly with community members. Um, and I did want to go into the different models um, that we've been exploring recently. Um, this, this slide gives you a little sample of new partners we've met the past couple of years. And I do think we are becoming more diverse. We've actually started to reach more historical societies, which is really wonderful because they're really hard to find and, and connect with. Um, many of them are offline. Um, and then we're also meeting um, more like cultural heritage, cultural groups, um, local kind of different groups. So it, it's, it's getting more localized, which I think is, is key. Um, so this gives you a sense of um, the community archiving workshop. This is a different a separate IMLS grant that we're working with um, a group of folks, archivists and conservators based all over the country actually um, through AMIA, Association of Moving Image Archivists. And California Revealed is actually just one hub um, for Northern California. There's hubs in the Southeast and Midwest with plans for additional hubs. Um, and this was started in 2019 with this group of partners. And we had plans to do several workshops before um, the pandemic. So we were able to do one in-person workshop, um, which is where these pictures come from with the Owens Valley Paiute Shoshone Cultural Center and Museum. And the model, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's an each one teach one model. So we go in and we work directly with community members and archivists to inventory, inspect, 
assess um, a local collection. And then we also talk about preservation basics and we bring in these wonderful kits. You can see on the bottom left-hand corner, you can see the little Pelican case where we pack everything up. And we can leave, actually this, these kits specifically are still in Bishop. Um, we left them there after the workshop for them to use. So they can get more kind of hands-on um, experience and actually digitize um, some VHS tapes. So we were able to, um, to do that once in person um, and we hope to do more um, when things open up again. But the hope is that um, we really are, you know, starting to meet more community members and if, and if people are willing to share, California Reveal would be happy um, to take copies and provide access to the, these um, family histories. And same thing with the memory labs. Um, we're really excited about this new partnership, which is just starting this year. Um, we're training the, um, this bottom group of folks who all received library, state library copycat grants. Um, but there are existing memory labs, thanks to the Memory Lab Network based out of DC Public Library. And we've, we're basing our training on all of those resources that they've provided, co-training actually with the project manager, Siobhan Hagen. So um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing um, where that goes and who we end up meeting. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Pamela. So up next, we've got Stephen Gong from CAM. So you can take it away, Stephen. Thank you very much, Morgan. Um, and thank you, Pamela. That was wonderful. Um, so one of, one of the things I'm struck by on this panel is that it is, even though our theme is about preservation and archiving, um, only one of us is an archive. And I think even Pamela, you sometimes say that you're not actually an archive, but so it's very interesting. We're, we're, we're actually parts of intersecting fields. And I think, you know, being here as part of the Sundance Festival and, and with a partner like the Roxy, you know, I, I know that all of us kind of understand that we're part of an ecosystem and, and that collections and the resources that you find in, in these collections are really important to storytelling in, in visual media. So I'm gonna just spend a couple of moments to tell you how CAM fits in with that. Um, the Center for Asian American Media, we're 40 years old and we, um, we produce, we support, we present uh, moving image stories that convey the richness and diversity of Asian American experiences to the broadest audience as possible. Uh, we have a film festival uh, that is regional and it's called CAMFest and it's usually in May and we're, vi we're busy uh, uh, programming that now, although we probably will have yet another year of doing this virtually, but we hope to have some, you know, that drive-ins at Fort Mason and that kind of stuff. We also do broadcasts and it is in the broadcasting area and in production support that we help make use of some of our uh, resources that all home movies in particular that I'll talk about in a bit. But first, I would I want to mention in some of that core work we support filmmakers, uh, Asian American filmmakers largely, who who are making documentary films for public television. And over the years, we've directly supported over 300 projects. And a part of that work, in part of that work, the filmmakers would leave with us a, uh, in the old days, a video submaster, you know, usually beta SP or something like that. And then over the decades, we kind of find that that is a valuable collection of, you know, Asian American independent film and which it's sometimes hard to track down those filmmakers. A lot of them maybe only made that first uh, film. So we were participants in a project called the uh, American Archives of Public Broadcasting, which was uh, organized and managed by WGBH, the public television station and the Library of Congress. And they worked with various, we all worked together with various other important partners. And that's where BAVAC came in because BAVAC was for all of us in, in our region and, and you might well have helped others. I, I don't know the details, but you actually did the transfer work. You know, we would sort of put boxes together of, uh, and, and in this case, six, more than 60 of our earliest um, 
videos were able to be transferred to the best quality and having a lot of glitches repaired, then these full uncompressed files were placed at uh, both uh, WGBH and the Library of Congress. And what we're excited about is that um, th they will be available and, and, and preserved for future generations. Okay, having said that, there is another uh, project that's so close to our hearts that I really wanted to talk about, and that's Memories to Light, Asian American Home Movies. And Morgan, if you will go ahead and play the trailer, and then I'll come back on afterwards and fill in a little bit. Great, thank you. Um, I think that told you a lot. And if you're interested, if you're holding home movies and you're Asian American, please get in touch with us. Um, the, the impetus for this project, which is, we started about six years ago, I think, um, was from uh, uh, a gentleman named Rick Prellinger, whom a lot of us, uh, maybe revere is too strong a word, but Rick's a longtime friend and really, uh, has a great approach to the importance of moving images and how they belong to a whole culture and society and how access, you know, really is the point of saving this stuff. So, um, so Rick and, and a number of other wonderful folks at the uh, Internet Archive have done, have provided a kind of the framework by which we can uh, collect images and share them in a, in a thoughtful uh, way that, that is non or less exploitive, let's say, of the way in which uh, resources have generally held. And that's by articulating a copyright commons where the families can retain control of the images in their home movies, and yet also grant a certain level of access so that the ultimate point is that all of these images belong to all of us as part of our cultural kind of heritage. And we're excited about bringing that forward. Um, and I think it goes without saying, to probably to everyone who's tuned in, because we're all sensitive to the importance of these images, that Asian American home movies, and the reason we were so excited to start this is, it is clear that, you know, uh, these home movies were the only real record of all, the way that uh, the Asian American community experienced life. You know, the mainstream images throughout the 20th century were relegated in, in mainstream media to very stereotyped roles. And even in, now we can even see that in, what do you say, even in, in other commercial type films, uh, newsreels, uh, all of those, because Asian Americans were not involved in making them, they provide only a very limited view of what our lives are like. So um, definitely we saw collecting these as an important way to build a resource, not only sort of for the families, but for in the broader community, but very much for Asian American filmmakers and other creative storytellers to have access and make use of these collections in telling uh, deeper, richer, more nuanced stories. And so that's uh, an aspect of the project that we've always tried to do. So one thing is we make, uh, and Morgan, if, if you have 
slides, you can start sprinkling something in. I won't, yeah. I, I'm gonna, you don't need to look at me. I wish I had a lot more slides, but you know, it's always fun to look I, at the, at the examples of some of the amazing images. And I wanted to thank Pamela. Uh, I recognize some of our images in your materials. So that's always very exciting to see. Um, but, but we uh, collect these images and of course, sometimes can help a family tell its own story. Uh, and that's an, and one important aspect. Another one is because uh, uh, so many of these filmed home movies, certainly before the 1970s, were silent. It gives us a chance to experiment with doing public presentations where we can have live musical accompaniment. And what we've done is, is asked, you know, sort of young Asian American musicians to provide a soundtrack for comp compiled collections uh, that we can show publicly. And then sometimes, you know, I, I've spoken over them. I, we did a project supported by uh, California Humanities on Asian American home movies from the Central Valley. And that was an interesting case because you could, we could combine Japanese American home movies, Filipino American home movies and, and Chinese American home movies. And you can see the, this amazing kind of story about how each of these communities had their own kind of experience, you know, in, in the Central Valley of California, where all of them were, all of our communities have been very important in, in the development of the whole agriculture industry. And um, uh, it, it became a mini thing in a way. So, um, the, there is an image up of, uh, of a presentation we've done of one of the musical performances that was up in Canada. So I finally, I guess I wanted to end by, by trying to take advantage of the unique combination we're gonna hear from Pedro in just a moment and get a, the view of a, of a filmmaker making use of archival images. But for all of us, I think we're in a particular moment of transformation of so many of our institutions and you know the vital need for um, for us to populate our storytelling with with much greater diversity. And uh, I think I, I I think there's another generation of archivists and and people like like Bayvac helping to get more and richer and deeper uh, images and out into society, into culture. And I would be interested in knowing how we can build on that. I, I just actually, you know, I thought of the question and then I just recalled Pamela's list at the end of showing all of those dozens of historical societies and different community-based uh, historical uh, entities, that's exactly, exactly where we need to be. So anyway, we're really excited at CAM to participate in that. And, and um, even though it's not really supported directly, it's supported by interns. And one of our interns is uh, Patricia Villon is, uh, has, is dialed into this conversation, I think. And I can't thank, thank her enough for helping keep this light burning. So as we come out of the pandemic, who knows, maybe uh, through conversations like this, we can enrich all of our work together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephen. And uh, it's really excellent. Uh, so Pedro is up next. Hi, thank you so much, Morgan. Uh, thank you to the Roxy Theater, Bayvac and Sundance. I'm really, really excited to be here and have this conversation with uh, this ex extraordinary group. Um, my name is Pedro Koss. I'm a filmmaker. Um, my uh, film, uh, Rebel Hearts, is playing at the this year's Sundance Film Festival. And um, we're really excited and lucky, actually, to bring this story out into the world that um, uh, without without the archives uh, and the and, enormous effort from an incredible team uh, would not have been be able to come to, to life. Um, and, you know, I'm a filmmaker who um, over the past many, many years, I've um, actually told, uh, had the for good fortune to be um, telling um, a lot of archival driven stories that, um, that have um, really tapped into the 
um, not only moving images, but you know, other sorts of archives to um, really bring uh, forth a history to life and um, to to help tell stories in, in unique and immersive ways. Uh, and I think that's sort of the goal um, as filmmakers is not only to um, uh, to tell an engaging story, but I think bring the history to life in a way that feels current and relevant to today's audiences. Um, um, as you will see in the clip, um, you might not think um, that we that we're actually using archives in the the clip from Mar Robo Harris that we're um, about to show you, but there actually is. Um, and so, um, uh, it, one of the ways that I want to discuss about the how you know different ways and sort of how to tap into different sorts of archives in order to bring stories to life. Um, so maybe let's check out this clip from Rebel Hearts. <clears throat> Do you know why your community is being investigated? The Cardinal decided on a new method of bringing um, correction into the community. And that was by sending a group of priests to interrogate every sister about what she thought of the way the community was going. Don't you think it will take too much time to fix your hair if you were to change your habit? Is the rule of silence being kept? Where will all of this experimentation lead your community? Each of us were interviewed several times by different representatives. Do you remember any of the questions? I, I prefer not to go into the details because they're really uh, rather embarrassing. Do you think the sister's sex life is affected by reading novels? Do you know how pornographic Ulysses is? Do you want to look like a floozy on Hollywood Boulevard? And then they relayed the message back to the Cardinal that our community was moving too fast and that we were very much determined on our uh, progression. Um, I realized that I actually uh, did not set up the film, uh, but the, in Rebel Hearts um, is as you can see from the clip, is the extraordinary story about the um, Immaculate Heart Sisters in the 1960s who began to reform um, and ran right up against um, the patriarchy of the Catholic Church, especially in Southern California, um, with the uh, rather um, very conservative um, Archbishop Cardinal McIntyre of Los Angeles. Um, and it led to um, a conflict that really played out um, in the media um, for, you know, many years. And um, it was a story that really reverberated at that time um, and, you know, led to um, uh, a birth of a movement and um, really a story that actually impacted religious communities around the world. Um, now, in this clip that you saw, you will, you know, is the, you see the interviews um, that our amazing producer, Shawnee Isaac Smith, be, who began documenting these uh, extraordinary women uh, over 20 years ago. Um, and uh, these interviews became sort of the, the foundation and the backbone of what the film is. And a lot of time, um, a lot of times, like for example, in this particular story, um, what we had uh, in terms of archives were the notes, um, the documents from the Immaculate Heart community um, of the questions that were asked when they were uh, basically audited or interrogated by um, uh, the, the so-called visitation of these uh, priests from the, from the Los Angeles Archdiocese that were sent basically to investigate them. Um, there are um, a lot of the archives that we, uh, that we worked with here were actually um, meeting notes, uh, notes and um, from the Immaculate Heart community or letters, um, photographs. And what we did was we, um, we thoroughly researched the, um, this. This also been documented in Anita Casper's book, who was the mother general of the Immaculate Heart Sisters at that time. Um, but we went through the, the, the notes and 
those were the questions that were uh, um, that were asked of these sisters. And so um, in order to bring this to life in a different way, we took those questions that were part of the archives and we brought it to life with animation. Um, so in order to make this sort of a more immersive experience for an audience um, and to bring that history to life. And in a way that's, um, um, it's working with archives and institutions in, um, in order to immerse ourselves in, with the history that was really important for, for the story and for every story. And also rethinking how to creatively use these archives. You know, we have uh, the ex also the extraordinary um, films that we, we not only tapped into all the news archives of um, the NBC News, the CBS News, the ABC News and the BBCs of the world, which had archives of, um, of that time from the story, but we also, um, uh, reached out and um, uh, with other filmmakers at that time who were uh, filming the Immaculate Heart Sisters and the Immaculate Heart um, uh, Order um, in the 1960s. Um, filmmakers like Bayless Glasscock, Tom Conrad, um, and uh, Haskell Wexler. And um, so it's an, in a way, um, it's an, was a huge effort to um, just kind of piece together the story and, and you know we called it our, our treasure hunt um, of finding hidden treasures um, but it took you know years and many many years of research um, and also um, of educating ourselves on how to best um, uh, find how to best uh, f find materials and also how to best scan preserve catalog, um, all these materials and in a way that um, once the film is done and completed or which it is done and completed, um, we it, how to have that archive for ourselves and also to with the um, personal archives that we work with to be able to um, to turn back the, the files to them um, and also the digitized copies. Um, and uh, you know, in a way that um, it, for future generations who maybe want to tap into these archives, um, that it is there. And that's the other thing it, that we'll, I'm excited to discuss um, with with this group is once once we finish, um, you know, the uh, film, our footage in a way, the footage that Shawnee has been working on uh, for over 20 years is, um, is should be part of an archive and how um, how that uh, in partnership with organizations um, like California Revealed or CAM like can be um, tapped into because I think we are as storytellers we are we are sitting on sometimes extraordinary treasure troves um, of unused uh, materials that can hopefully be used, you know, later um, or at another point in, uh, in time to tell different stories. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, not only from, from Rebel Hearts, but a lot of the films that I've been fortunate to, to work on, um, that is definitely an issue. And we, um, I think from the perspective of a storyteller working a lot with archival materials, it would be great and very helpful to, um, to partner with other organizations for sort of um, future lives of the materials that we that we are, are capturing ourselves as well. Um, so, yeah, th that's a, a little bit of my um, process and perspective. But excited to to um, hear from everybody. Yeah, I mean that's a great way to kind of kick off this conversation. Thanks so much to all of you for presenting your organizations and the film and. Uh, I mean, that kind of brings back to what Stephen said about the fact that we are all kind of part of this ecosystem. And part of the panel is kind of just like identifying the sort of, it, like it kind of comes full circle, right? Like like you said, like uh, Pedro, that you're using, you're creating materials that might become part of an archive in the future. And everybody on this panel is kind of involved in one part of this ecosystem. And then uh I, stuff comes out on the other end and then gets used in another kind of transformative work. And what Bayback does with the preservation access program is like, 
because we kind of pair the preservation and the access together is we're really trying to make sure that these materials get used, get viewed, get used in transformative works. Um, the funding originally came from the National Endowment of the Arts for, for the Arts because, and so because of that, we had to stick to stuff that was like artistically significant, but uh, we always made allotments for, you know, if you're a filmmaker, then film is artistically significant. I believe most people in this audience and on this panel would agree to that. But, but yeah, um, I mean, does, I, I have like just a lot of thoughts. Um, one thing that Pamela, that you mentioned was like something is better than nothing. And I was wondering if any of you can speak to that, like, like the, a lot of the times, you know, we like to, a lot of people like, you know, we want to save everything, but we, we can't, like you said, like there's this, there's a finite amount of resources available to do this work. So like, what are some of the decisions that you make? Can, can you speak to like the kind of decisions that you're making based around that, that ethos? Yeah. So, and you know, this is where we ask the partners to make these tough decisions because they're closest to the materials and closest to the communities, you know, they're serving. So, we asked them, I mean, our, our connection is California history, so that we're very broad in like a really wonderful way, like we keep it really open. Um, California history, culture, art, you know. So um, that's our only true requirement, but then when it comes down to like selecting and making those tough decisions, we ask them to consider, um, you know, condition, like if it's on a, an obsolete format or magnetic media, um, that window, right, the magnetic media <laughs> crisis, it's still, I guess that window's closed at this point because um, it's been 15 years um, yeah. urgency. So here we are um, 15 years later. So there's considerations of condition, um, the actual material. And then when it comes down to the content, we ask people to just consider like potential use. Um, maybe they're getting a lot of requests for particular collections. So then there's interest kind of inherently built in and people want to see it or if it's online, even better. Um, so that's that's part of it. Um, but we, we do try to keep it open because we want we, we don't want to be in that position of making that tough decision. Right, right. And, and so do you, um, like with the thing of like, you know, something is better than nothing, like if you were to digitize something just by like pointing like your phone camera at like a screen of it playing, like that's not really like archival preservation, but it is kind of this one step. Like, do you have any, do, mm. do, do any of you have any thoughts about just kind of people like taking things into their own hands <laughs> as far as like saving things that are otherwise going to be lost? Yeah, I mean, I think that there, there has to be a middle ground because even we make exceptions. I mean, we weren't doing high def until recently. You know, we weren't doing 2K scans of film until recently because we couldn't afford to. Um, but, you know, the costs have gotten cheaper. Storage has gotten cheaper. And we're now able to meet that standard. But we don't expect everyone to be able to do that because um, it's, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I feel like with like the memory labs and a lot of these kind of community archiving efforts, like people are trying to find that happy medium because yeah, you shooting with your phone isn't quite enough, but buying like a $300 flatbed scanner and starting, you know, incrementally, like starting with maybe VHS, like getting a somewhat nice like commercial deck is like better than like something you find at the thrift store. I don't know, like, I think that there are levels of preservation that we have to accommodate. Otherwise, yeah, we're just gonna lose so much. Yeah, I, uh, Morgan, if I could, um, just to jump in, when we developed Memories to Light, you know, it was based on off of really one, I think it was just an eight millimeter collection that Rick had, had uh, come across from San Francisco. And he, had, you know, came to us and just said, I bet there's a lot more like this out there. But we decided to just set in practical terms because we really don't have funding for this. Uh, but we recognized that those home movies that were on the film medium, in a sense, were e extremely endangered now because of you know just um, chemical deterioration of their their older materials. But also, of course, because um, you know project home projection and things like that had become outmoded we knew that all of these collections at best were sitting in 
you know, someone's garage, a, a grandparent, and, and we only had a certain kind of window. And, and one of the issues was that at the time we started this, you know, in a lot of parts of the field, it was still, it was still common practice to, tr to hold a standard that film materials should be photochemically preserved on film. And, and, you know, that's really difficult for Super 8 and 8 millimeter because you lose so much, you know, and, and yet um, digital solutions were just starting to come online where you could do very good, you know, high, a high fairly high resolution individual frame, you know, a digitization. Um, I think that was a game changer because for me that really unlocks at a much lower cost, right? Uh, and, and we saw a role we could play, which was to reach out to families. So, you know, to me, when in particular, you, you can see certain trends, actually, I wanted to get to this, I'm gonna shift it a little bit. To me, it was just the, the Japanese American community, for instance, is such a um, leading, you know, early adopter of technology, particularly photography and camera work. So even from the thirties, when we could come across 16 millimeter collections from Japanese American community, they are really good looking, you know? And wow. I guess the corollary, the reason I wanted to bring that up because we were afraid to get into uh, a video because, you know, the, the amount of material is so much more for each family. And, and even though, and I know we, you know, all of us need to confront uh, the, the earliest decades of uh, analog video are now just as endangered. And I know you know that Morgan better than anyone, but we were just still afraid of how do we get in there and then we're gonna be watching, you know, three hours of soccer practice and stuff like that, you know, and, and the excruciating baby's first steps, you know, and I know that that's an all day affair to shoot, you know, so anyway. Just in practical terms, that there are real some there. There's a way in which technology can suddenly help us, you know, unlock a whole, a whole group of action. And yeah, we just have to work this out sometimes in the real, in the real crucible of sort of saying what what are our uh, what's our capacity right now and what's the best way to go in, in, in preserving this mountain of material. Yeah, the technology is just such a. It's funny, like you said, like. Just talking about that that nexus where that inflection point where some at one point digital storage and digital infrastructure becomes cheaper than doing these photochemical and like more sustainable than doing these photochemical. I mean, I know there's film people maybe in the audience who are like, you know, digitization of film is not preservation. Like there is like maybe that there is that opinion. That, but but you know, uh, with video like the the magnetic tape media is not stable and it like it, it just needs to be. Things need to be digitized. That's that's the that's like where we are at with uh, magnetic tape storage, and um, it's it is just uh, like it's funny because even stuff that was that we can think of like sort of not having to reach back all the way back in time, but like mini DV stuff that was shot on mini DV is actually extremely endangered now because the tapes are small, the mechanics are of them are sort of rough and and. You know the the trade off of having these tiny little tapes that you could go shoot on a camcorder with relatively good quality is trading off now that a lot of them are damaged, a lot of them are deteriorating, and so it, it actually is in some ways, you know, you're getting uh, having an easier time with older tape formats than these new ones. And Peter, I know that so so you had mentioned that some of the um, footage was originally shot on mini DV that is being used in this film now. So you're not even just like creating something that is going to go into an archive. You're using materials that were shot for the project that are now considered like archival materials. Exactly, which is which is an interesting place to be. Um, our when when Shawnee when Shawnee Isaac Smith began documenting the Immaculate Heart uh, community um, and um, the former sisters, uh, sh that was in the late 90s, early 2000s. So she the tech, the technology at that time, the best was the mini DV, um, and a lot of the um, the main interviews, the these firsthand accounts with these extraordinary women was done on mini DV, and I actually have in that closet um, a a deck, a mini DV deck that, uh, um, you know, a higher end one, um, but it still posed a lot of, uh, in a way challenges. We had to retransfer the material again. Um, and, um, you know, they are fragile, the, the mini DVD tapes. Yeah. 
And so our, in, in a way, our own original material, in, in a way we were actually already having to treat sort of as archival material um, um, to, and in a way, once we digitized in, um, we were working with our post-production house um, in a way to find out the best way to up-res that um, for our current uh, HD 4K, actually even 4K world, um, where we actually end up ended up not going the 4K route on Rebel Hearts. A lot of, you know, really because of, one of the main reasons was really because of this, but, um, uh, but yeah, we, you know, trying out new technologies of up-resing, um, you know, using, um, uh, I, I think, uh, I'm trying to, I'm blanking on the name of the up-res um, uh, software that we uh, that we stumbled upon doing an extensive amount of research, which actually that's the other thing that I, I would love to to bring up is um, you know storyteller documentary filmmakers can actually be um, you know Pamela was talking about how we're you know you can't preserve everything, but um, for us, for example, going on the journey of making Rebel Hearts, we um, we were tapping into a lot of personal archives, archives that have have not were not digitized, and so I think we can be a partner in in the preservation. And one of the things is that for us as filmmakers to be to know of organizations like um, like California Review, like Cam, to um, actually to really educate ourselves on best best practices, best practices of, uh, of archiving, of logging, of digitizing. Um, and that's for us would be an extraordinary resource um, to, to know about and to partner with because um, uh, we, uh, many times we are tapping into archives that have not been discovered for you know, years, decades. Um, and for us to know how to best handle that material and how to best log, capture, uh, and then you know digitize and then turn over to future archives um, is would be an, an extraordinary you, you know knowledge and um, really skilled to have. And you know we work with amazing archival producers a lot of times who have that knowledge. But I think for with having inside and in mind the um, the future preservation of the, this material um, is extremely important. And then the second thing I wanted to mention is in terms of hard drives and we're working with hard drives. I remember that on The Square, which was a film that I edited about the uh, Arab Spring in Egypt um, in 2013, 2014, um, we were working with um, 600 hours of original material, which um, was really, uh, I think is really an extraordinary archive of that period of time in Egypt. But, you know, after the film was completed and done, we actually had initial conversations with some educational institutions about how to best preserve that material because that material lived in hard drives. And then hard drives, as we all know, fail regularly and we we need to educate ourselves on best practices and sometimes we don't have the the resources uh and the time after the film's completed to uh to maintain those hard drives in the way they they need to be maintained so that they have less of a chance of failing and so that's something that we on the storyteller front and i'm i think both you know, both you, Pamela, and Stephen also run into with dealing of this preservation. What is the safest way to preserve materials for the long digital digital material for the long run? Yeah, we're going to have to bring on a digital preservationist onto this panel to <laughs> give us those <laughs> answers. Uh, I uh, that mean the there's like I mean I would love to get into like a technical nerd talk about this sort of stuff because that's like what I do on a daily basis but those are great questions and and really like I what I one thing that really astounds me about the archival community is just how good at sharing resources and sharing resources sharing information um, and sharing like basically building the networks from the ground up they are like California Revealed is doing this amazing work of basically 
finding all the, the work that needs to be preserved and bringing it in and then using the resources that are available. And then with Cam, uh, Stephen, you had mentioned the, the AAPB project that we work with. And what was great about that was that um, Tanya Yule was the person who actually digitized those materials at Bayback, and she was from San Jose State University. And so she, she we had a station at Bayback for her to transfer those materials, and she came in and was essentially learning. And so not only did you get the materials digitized, the Library of Congress got them, and the American Archive of Public Broadcasting you know, got copies of them digitally, you got copies digitally, and the person doing the digitization was learning at the same time in a professional environment. And that is like, I mean, it was an incredible success story, but it's not uncommon in the archival community for those sorts of projects. Those are, those are the projects that are getting uh, the hype and the funding right now because they work. I mean, they, they're, we don't have enough resources to do it ourselves. And so the distributed networks are really what's successful. I also want to say, um, for anybody watching, if you have any questions, put them in the, in the chat because we'd love to address any questions that you may have. I know somebody said that you have um, so many questions as a filmmaker. Please drop them in the chat. Um, I mean, I know, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that, Pamela? I had a, well, I did have a question for Pedro because I'm wondering like how this network could work for independent filmmakers because it seems like everyone's working on their own projects, you know, and you kind of go deep into that world and then you're out of it with this like, you know, a massed mountain of material. And so I'm just wondering if maybe part of the trick would be thinking archivally as soon as you start planning the project. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's a lot to ask, but maybe like building in levels of preservation each step of the production process, even at that moment when you're gathering the pieces, thinking about where are these pieces going to go in the end, and then capturing all the right kind of descriptive information for each tape. You know, all these little details archivists love. <laughs> so. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's like a compromise that we could find, you know, that kind of meets you in that production environment. So it's not too laborious, but would be like an amazing service to the materials later. Yeah, I mean, I've yeah, heard I mean, like, oh, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was just gonna say, yeah, I think one of the tricky things is that when we start a lot of times, um, when we, we embark, began to embark on the journey of Rebel Hearts, um, it was a very small team and, you know, with very limited resources. And we got to pull, a, we had to pull the materials that we had at that time. I uh, put together a promo fundraising trailer. We went out, we, in, in sort of the, the, you know, the initial fundraising process goes little by little. You get a little bit here, a little grant here. Um, we got an incredible grant from the Catapult Film Fund, uh, actually a San Francisco based um, organization um, to start the project. And with that, we some of that funding was um, was allocated to um, archival to archival archival gathering. On every art on, on every project, every archival driven project, um, one of the things that we do is um, we we love spreadsheets. So we create a database. Um, and that's, and a lot of times I usually just take it from the, that database is basically kind of like, oh, well, let's kind of start working with the, the one that I used on the previous project. But that's, I think, uh, maybe there's a unique opportunity there in what is in, um, how that, uh, that spreadsheet, what uh, that beta database includes, so that we automatically can already um, begin gathering some of that information that will be valuable later down in the road once the, the film is completed. I think that's maybe um, one of the ways that we can, you know, start thinking really long term, even yes. when we're sort of getting going and it's not as a, you know, you know it's not resource um, heavy, but that can really benefit. Um, Spreadsheet as the common ground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> We love them. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and also the other thing is, um, in a way, best practices of scanning and digitizing. Sometimes we, for the film itself, we need, um, we will probably optimize uh, 
the level of scanning that you know for projection for um, broadcast and ex exhibition. Um, but if that meets the same standard, you know, um, that is th the best practices for long-term archival, then I think um, that we should also, you know, look into that in, in, in a way of, uh, of how to best digitize that serves both, um, both world, you know, both scenarios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, highest resolution is always the best, but then there's always that striving for like an open format, you know, that's not too dependent on various systems. But yeah, I mean, of course, I'm thinking every documentary project just needs to hire an archivist <laughs> to have like <laughs> on hand. Um, and yeah, what would that look like in terms of fundraising? I mean, to me, it seems very fundable, but I, I don't know. I, I think that's <laughs> like I think that's a great idea because I know a bunch of archivists that are always looking for work and that, and that are really skilled in that, you know, and then they would just, you know, hop on and it would be like this closed system. I mean, uh, yeah, Bebek, we're always trying to find a way to connect the archives and the filmmakers because we have them, you know, put these same things in the same room, like down, you know, in one room we're digitizing tapes and the next room down, I mean, when, <laughs> when we're in the office, there's a convening of, of documentary filmmakers through our Media Maker Fellowship, which is a bunch of documentary filmmakers working to create films that sometimes use archival materials or will become archival materials. Uh, there is a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, well, I was just going to, well, one, one of the things I do think um, are already emerging and you could see it in, in Pamela's that big list, you know, in that, in that uh, specialized communities with a real interest in one particular and, and knowledge and deep knowledge of that subject are really vital, you know, so then rather than thinking that we would need, um, that we could have just one single repository or one place that re could recognize the value of everything, it's a little messier, but maybe it's like the future of a, of a truly uh, diverse um, and inclusive America. Uh, but, but in the Asian American archival community, I, I know that, that a lot of folks know about Densho, which is the Japanese American online digital archive, and SADA, which is South Asian um, uh, archive. And what's amazing, I think, is, is in, in, in supporting the work of many other filmmakers and storytellers and artists, that these kind of collections can, can grow with their own sort of uh, focus, as it were, and providing the, the context we need and the resources. So, so one of our great uh, filmmakers in our community was a woman named Lonnie Dang. And, and Morgan, you guys preserved all of Lonnie's early work. Well, she did some of the earliest documentaries on the internment of Japanese Americans. And, and only as you guys, as Pedro would well know, when you interview like, you know, 20 veterans of World War II, you know, the, the Japanese American veterans, you end up only using, you know, eight, eight minutes, you know, a total, right, out of, of a hundred hours of interview. So, but what was wonderful is that Lonnie held on to all of these analog uh, video files of her interviews. And then lo and behold, Densho comes along with a real commitment. And so they took all of those uh, materials after she passed away, we worked with the family to find the right place. So they're all part of Densho. And now you've got hundreds of hours of interviews. So one of them, Pedro, very much, I do think is like, what? what institutional base would really see the value of even more of the raw materials, you know, rather than just the finished film, because the finished film can have its own track for being preserved, which is important, but it's sometimes it's that raw material that's really, really important. It is, and then it's, it's crucial, I, I think, to preserve that, you know, from, um, especially these, uh, these oral, these recorded histories, um, I think are just, there are treasures and they need to be preserved um, um, in the best way possible. And I wanted to agree with Pamela, what Pamela said. I think every documentary, uh, archival documentary should have uh, an, an archivist. We, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to, um, uh, to our archival producer, associate and archival producer, Gabriella Ricketts, who, um, has been on Rebel Hearts, has been with us since uh, 2016 or 17, um, and has been the one who's been on the project for the longest. Um, and really sort of 
required the Gabriella to become an expert in the story and this history um, and to do a deep dive into it and uh, both um, uh, both gaining the knowledge, um, but and also um, kind of locating where you know where everything was from the the personal archives to the community's archives um, and to the broadcasters and other filmmakers' archives. So um, without Gabriella, I'm this and you know the spe the spreadsheet the the enormous spreadsheet that she's been working on is is also a masterwork i have to say so uh <laughs> um yeah we would there would be no film without that years many years long process and uh it really took that and sort of filtering you know how to filter that and what to look for um was really just a, a very painstaking and, and long process which um i think documentarians would uh uh would agree with yeah yeah uh so somebody in the in the chat had asked um is there a best practice guide or cheat sheet for organizing and preserving analog or celluloid media for new filmmakers um and then somebody linked uh Bayback, we wrote a paper that was called a uh, guide to approaching audiovisual digitization uh for artists uh that is sort of a getting started if you've got a big collection kind of where to start it talks about um, how to assess your materials and whatnot but also the I know the community at almost a simpler level, not simpler, but kind of like a, a kind of getting started, like the community archiving workshop has a kind of a guide, just like a piece of paper you can download that has information about how to describe your objects. You can just have sort of like a record that describes. Pamela, do you have more info about that? There's, there's definitely like essential fields that, you know, at minimum you need to look out for um, in describing each item. Um, but yeah, I feel like there there needs to be more resources for filmmakers specifically who are just in the the process, like so deep in the process. Like I understand it's probably hard to really like step back and think long term when you're just you're you're immersed. Um, yeah, I, I feel I was like gonna... that might be in a good position to create that resource. I think yeah, I I mean that's really like a, we are we are looking at doing programming and getting funding for um, kind of expanding preservation, like making, you know, at any organization, sometimes departments just, you know, sort of don't talk to each other as much as they should. And with everybody being working from home, that kind of, it's funny that we're actually trying to get over that because like, it's just like easier to just chat online all the time. But one thing that we're sort of working on, we have an intern that is currently writing, uh, her name's Monica Nolan, and she's writing a research paper about whether or not it's going to be useful for Bayback to start documenting uh, content in the tapes that we digitize according to some sort of like rubric of like content description. So right now, when we, we do all tapes one at a time, we kind of take a, if you don't know, we take like a boutique approach to digitization. So when we give somebody their video files, they also get a ton of notes about where there was errors, if there was any problems, um, like where, you know, the tape may have been damaged and then you see an error. So, you know, oh, this was because of tape damage, not because somebody fell asleep at the wheel or something or something like that. So we're thinking it might be a good idea for us or to figure out how we would do it if we start describing content that sort of f fits into this <laughs> nebulous subject of it being culturally significant. Like, of course, it's like this very silly way to describe something. But if we, if you see something that might be good for a researcher, for a filmmaker, or for an archive to know about their own content, because, you know, we're going to sit down and we're going to watch all the tapes. Maybe the people who receive the information will do that, or maybe it will sit on a hard drive until somebody asks for it later. We're basically, we, we have the understanding, we may be the last person, people to see this go by, and it is our job to see it go by. So at that point, why not start describing the content? Um, so we're, we're looking, we're doing some research about that and trying to get funding to make that, get that off the ground. That sounds great. Cause that's our, that's a, a real limited resource is real time. You know, like we, no one really has real time, but you have to be there. <laughs> right, right. We're the, we're the ones that have to be <laughs> there and watch it. Think so. You might as well, yeah, write down what you see. It would be amazing, amazing resource. Cause for us, we're only able to check, you know, half 30 to, 50% of the recording, if, if anything, like we do beginning, middle and end, like we just can't afford real-time QC. So 
and that's for us. And then on the other side, the, the partner, we ask them to do 100 percent. But the reality is like, yeah, no one really has that much time. Right. Right. No, I mean, you know, we do quality control here, but the quality control person isn't watching it the whole thing. They're watching the beginning, middle, end, and then checking that everything kind of yeah. is, is looks okay on a technical level. But that's all the more reason Pedro or, you know, anyone who's like on the ground actually making these interviews, it's like, write down like name, date, you know, like just basics, like can go a long way. Yeah, uh, there's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Exactly. And one of the things, for example, in, in every film that I, every interview that we do is transcribed with Wonderful. time code and yeah. um, because that actually we need that editorially um, to so that's one of the things just not to discard it's if just for interviews for example not to discard these transcripts and then pair them with the you know have those files basically maybe stored along with the the interviews themselves so exactly. you, they have, there's a date there's the transcript and all that and any annotations of what, because we do that on the field. We try to really do that in the field um, okay. when that is mm -hmm. taking place. Yeah, yeah that, there was a question in the chat about best practices uh, or guide for online accessibility of a film collection. And that is sort of like having that information available and paired mm -hmm. in some way is a huge part of that. Um, also, I mean, there are government guidelines. Like if, if you, if you are a government agency and you put something online, it has to have uh, closed captioning or subtitles uh, for the hearing impaired. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a really excellent way. I mean, when we think about accessibility, it doesn't have to just be like, I click on a link and I see it or I'm able to find it. But you have to think about, you know, if people can actually engage with it, if they are hearing impaired or seeing impaired, or if you know, they are don't have the internet because they can't afford it. Uh, there, there's a lot of considerations as far as accessibility. I believe, I mean, I'm sure there's uh, a lot of papers, like people have written about this, but I can't think of a particular like guide unless anybody has one of those. <laughs> Is there a way to connect with the people who are registered? We can send out resources after this. Yeah, we have a list of emails, so we can send out some resources and, and I can think of I can definitely think of like a, you know, a reading list if anybody's interested. Uh, Steven, somebody also asked um, if there's any interest in revitalizing the submaster elements uh, that had been digitized from AAPB. Uh, and they said they're thinking of Spencer Nakasako's uh, work, which was all video eight and mini DV. Wonderful shout out to Spencer. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and uh, AKA Don Bonus, um, a wonderful, important documentary film that he made. Um, yeah, we do think about it. And the AAPB project allowed us, you know, to, to want to try to go in. And, but I have to say, you know, and some we we're able to do, you know, to, to kind of get, get material more out there in front of uh, people again and available for educational distribution. Um, you know, it's one of these things. I mean, rights, it cuts both ways, right? You, you um, the, the makers, oftentimes it may be their only source of income. So, that, you know, they're a little bit leery of, of an archive wanting to make materials accessible in the final form. You know, I think it's an aspect that the Internet Archives has tried to kind of lead the way to show an example of how at lower resolution you can make things available and, you know, and, and, and as it were, still respect the, the, this whole kind of rights issue. Um, and then just the practical one, just trying to get in touch, trying to figure out where the rights holder is nowadays, you know, or where uh, you, you do find in 30 years, you know, people did, you know, drop out of sight. So, so in any way, for a small organization, just tracking down people's been difficult. So I, I just think there's, I think we got a ways to go. Um, but you know, as, as long as we're working from home in the pandemic, I got a lot more hours. I don't commute. Maybe I could look <laughs> up. Maybe I could do a little more detective work. I don't know. So, but I think the person for the question. There's no doubt that, um, yeah, that that. The, the relevance of all of these kinds of materials, I, you know, that's, that's something about all of us in the independent media community sort of, sort of share that it's coming from 
a, a notion of, of wanting to tell authentic or vital stories. It binds us together. I think we will figure out the way. I mean, the story of Crip Camp, let me just break in and just say, that is like, that was amazing. And, and just knowing how important it was that they have that original footage and, and, and thanks to that wonderful filmmaking team to realize that that's the heart. You know, you wanna tell a story about disability rights kind of today, but, but then you look at what formulated that whole generation to, to, to see how important it was that they could, you know, could identify the source of their own strength and resilience. Anyway, I'm just over the moon. That proves it for, for archives. Boom, we're done. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that, the Crip Camp was a huge success story for, in so many facets. And for the Preservation Access Program, like that, like really like made our hearts swell because that, uh, the uh, Howard Gustat, who was, he, who, with the People's Video Theater, uh, that was in his, collection in his closet and he came to Bayback and he said I can finally afford to digitize this material because he got subsidized uh, rates for through the preservation and access program so um, it was just like all the pieces lined up perfectly for for that material to be be able to use in that in that documentary and it's really incredible um, so there was a question uh, Pedro, they said, how, how do streaming services like Netflix view upres material? And people wanted the name of the, uh, the uprising software that you use for Rebel Hearts, if you have that, or you can give it to us later. Yeah, I can, I, if, oh, actually, I, I can find out shortly. Um, starts with a T. Um, it's not a topic, but I'll, I'll find out shortly. Um, but in terms of... Um, uh, streaming the the streamers they right nowadays the preferred delivery um, format is 4K that's that's the world that we live in um, but but many times uh, with certain projects like Rebel Hearts that is not the the ideal finishing uh, format um, for us is it is still HD um, because a lot of the uprising um, still is not, for example, our film transfers are in 2K. Uh, it was not ideal to transfer that 16 millimeter um, from the 60s that we had to 4K. It, we, we were getting um, weird artifacting. So it was actually the lab said like that it is best to transfer a 2K, um, which is HD, uh, for, for that. So because of all of these materials that we were doing, the ideal um, uh, the ideal finishing format for us was um, HD. So the streamers do work with us. Their preferred, their, their preferred delivery method right now is all 4K. Um, and I'll, some of the material that we shot, the, the our original material um, that I started film, you know, starting about four or five years ago, was in 4K. But that was um, we downrezzed that to sort of meet um to level it out so um that was yeah, that, sort of our, and now I'll, I'll find out shortly um what our what the name of that software is um because it's yeah. actually fairly new we we really um did a little bit of digging and we came across it and we tried it out and actually worked quite well um, we'll send that out with the reading list <laughs> <laughs> it, it's so funny to think about just like things being 4k because i mean there's so many materials like if, if you're working in an archive on a documentary with archival AV materials, those are almost like, like they're gonna be standard definition and like compared to standard definition, like in my screen here, standard definition, is like this tiny little chunk of a 4K screen. It is just like so extremely tiny compared to 4K. So it's, it's very funny. Uh, Bayback, we, we do some upscaling too with a Terranex. We can upscale stuff to HD, um, which we're doing to support documentary filmmakers. But but yeah, the, the times, the, the, the resolutions are going to keep getting bigger and standard definition is going to stay the same size, a very, very small size. Um, and then somebody had, had asked if they could have con your contact information, Pedro. Uh, can we put contact information uh, in the reading list or is, is that okay with you? Sure, actually, I just got the name of the software. It's called Topaz. 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 Um, and I can uh, send you 
we can put a link to it. I mean, we we don't have any affiliation with Topaz, so it's uh, <laughs> and it's a I think it's a fairly new software. So that's yeah. great. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we're we're getting close to the wrap up time, and I really want to thank all of you for coming. This is really excellent, and just talking about so many different facets of working with archival footage and thank you so much for everybody who is participating in the chat and who came and is watching this. I really hope that you all enjoy the rest of your virtual Sundance experience. And if anybody has anything they want to sign off with any closing thoughts. No, great. Thank you very much, Morgan. Thanks to the Roxy for being our host on this. It's just really been great fun. I hope to see you all in live someday. Here, here. Non virtual. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Morgan, so much. I'll panel again, please. So. <laughs> yeah, here, looking really... forward to. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, really looking forward to continuing the conversation. And I think these, um, uh, uh, these extraordinary institutions um, are you know, a, a lifeline for us um, filmmakers as well. So thank you. Stephen and Pamela for for the the work that you do. Thank you for yeah. thinking archivally. You know, it's wonderful that you want to find a home to those materials. So let's make it happen. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and Pamela is incredible at doing that. I would say. It's very. <laughs> it's very the good. strength of the network. It's not. Yeah. Me. <laughs> it's really it is the strength of the network that's we're all relying on that we like none of us have the resources to do it all of us all ourselves yeah, the ecosystem <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah and if anybody has any questions email me at preservation at bayvac.org uh, or you can email the roxy but have a great rest of your weekend everybody thanks so much bye everybody bye, bye.